All right, let's do some examples. First, let's do an example question for Fourier's law. Remember, Fourier's law was steady state thermal transport. So we're losing rate, losing heat, and we're losing it at a steady rate. So here's what the question says. It says, you decide to do a half Ironman in November with a one mile swim in Bear Lake. If an average male adult swimmer has some body surface area and some weight, and they're gonna spend 35 minutes in 40 degree Fahrenheit water wearing a full body three millimeter neoprene wetsuit, that has a thermal conductivity of 0.054 watts per meter Kelvin, how much heat will the body lose? If the heat capacity of the human body is given as 3,470 joules per kilogram Celsius, what will be their final body temperature at the end of the swim? And then last question is, if hypothermia occurs when your body goes below 95 degrees, should this person be worried that they're gonna get hypothermia under these conditions? Okay, so let's do it. Uh, so, uh, drawing this out, you have a human body, which we will just draw as a sphere, right? So here's your human, right? The human is surrounded by neoprene, right? We know the thickness of that neoprene. The thickness of this suit is three millimeters. The thermal conductivity of that neoprene we know is 0 0.054 watts per meter Kelvin, right? We know the heat capacity of a human body. We know the surface area we know the mass, right, of the human body. We know all those things, right? We know the temperature of the water out here. The temperature out here is 40 degrees Fahrenheit. A human body is 30, what, 98.6 degrees, which is uh, 310 Kelvin, right? So uh, we know that heat is gonna be doing this. We're gonna be losing heat. Now, what we're assuming is the following, that the flux of heat, right, so Q per area per time is equal to negative, thermal conductivity times the difference in temperature dt dx. So again, in order for this to be Fick's first law or Fourier's law, a couple things have to be true. First off, this has to be constant, right? We have to have constant loss over here. This can't be changing this whole term, right? That will only be the case if this is not changing. And as a person cools down, then the temperature difference across this from the body to the water is changing. But in this case, we're going to say that it's not changing very much. It's a small change. Therefore, this is basically constant. That's the assumption here, right? Okay, so let's keep going. Uh, this is Fourier's law. So let's start plugging in some numbers, right? So 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit is 310 degrees, right? So 310 Kelvin is equal to 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. The water, if it's at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm gonna put this in Kelvin, that's equal to 277 Kelvin, about, okay? Okay, so let's calculate how much heat gets lost. Q, Q, our heat flux, is gonna be equal to negative of our thermal conductivity, so that's negative 0.054 watts per meter Kelvin. That's gonna be multiplied by our difference in temperature. So that's gonna be 310 minus 277, 310 degrees minus 277 degrees, right? That's in Kelvin. Um, divided by the thickness of the wetsuit, that's gonna be 3e to the negative three meters, right? So it's gonna be zero minus 3e to the negative three meters, okay? So that will tell us uh, the watts per meter squared lost, right? So when I plug these into my calculators, I find that's equal to 594 watts per meter squared, right? And this is equal to joules per meter squared per second, okay? So now, how do we figure out the total amount of joules lost? Well, we have to take into account the surface area and how long they're in the water. Great, we can do that. So we're gonna multiply that 594 joules per meter squared per second. We're gonna multiply that by 1.9 meters squared, multiply that by 35 minutes, multiply that by 60 seconds in a minute, right? And we're gonna end up with the total amount of heat lost in this race, which is 2.37 million joules. 2.37 e to the sixth joules. That's how much heat technically gets lost with this approach, right? So how cold did the person get? To answer that question, we need to do heat capacity, right? So we can do heat capacity. We know that heat capacity is a constant and it's equal to the, the exchange of heat, right? DQ over DT, right? 
So this is equal to, for a material for a human, it's 3,470 joules per kilogram per delta T, okay? So let's set that equal to the heat that we've lost, 2.37 e to the 6 joules. And then we need to figure out the mass of the person and how much temperature they've lost. So we've said that the person is 77, degree, or 77 kilograms. Then we can solve for our delta T. When I solve for delta T, I get that it's 8.8 .8, um, degrees Celsius or Kelvin, right, is how much it's lost. And if you translate that to the change in temperature, you find that this person would be at 82 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very hypothermic. Nevertheless, people swim uh, marathons in colder lakes than Bear Lake here in Utah. Um, so why are they not all getting hypothermic? Do they have better wetsuits than this? Better than a three mil neoprene? Probably not, they're probably swimming in those. So what are we neglecting? Well, there's a couple things. First off, something should make it worse is the fact that they're breathing, right? They're breathing out their warm air, right? And they're taking in cold air probably. So that convection is gonna make it even worse for them. It means they're getting even colder. But we're not accounting for their metabolic heat generation. People are like little tiny motors, right? We generate heat by eating food. We then break that food down at a molecular level and we turn it into heat. So we didn't include that in this calculation. And that's why people don't actually get hypothermia when they're swimming is they warm themselves up. They have some molecular um, generation of heat and that's why people don't get hypothermia, right?